Okay, great. All right, so uh, thanks for the intro, Elizabeth. Um, like she said, uh, my name is John Heyman. I'm a researcher here at IDA. Um, gee, it's great to be back at work. Um, <laughs> uh, I co-lead a team of researchers focused on AI autonomy, um, design of experiments, data analysis, survey design, and other things. Um, if that sounds interesting to you, uh, please talk to me during the break so that I can get you a job application. Um, today I want to talk a little bit, uh, um, kind of a fuzzy topic. I want to talk about what statisticians can do um, to improve modeling and simulation um, studies. Um, there's a few things I basically want to accomplish with this talk since I'm the first in the session. I want to um, give a little bit, of ex little bit of an explainer of what modeling and sim is and kind of how we use it in the department and why it's important. And I want to reflect on the statistical practice of modeling and sim. Um, I want to point out that um, probably some of you have heard about the reproducible uh, replicability crisis in science. I want to sort of point out that um, we're not immune from that sort of thing, so we really have a duty to do a really good job with our data analysis. And this is where statisticians can be a big help. So I want to connect kind of what we do in modeling and simulation with what other disciplines are doing in, you know, science. And I also want to provide recommendations that um, statisticians and other analysts can sort of take back to their work so that we can all do uh, a better job, okay? So that's kind of my idea. Um, and if that sounds good, I'll go ahead and talk a little bit about what models are and kind of how we use them. So my background is I work in the Operational Evaluation Division here at IDA. Um, and we use models or MNS um, to help us with a, a huge range of test and evaluation uh, questions. And so I just sort of have enumerated here some of the reasons why we use models um, in T&E. And um, a lot of it comes down to um, we're trying to supplement what we can actually test, what we can actually gather from live data. Um, but our live data experiments are cost or safety prohibitive. Um, there's a lot of situations where we can't do a live test, but we need to do some kind of inference. And so modeling is really the best way to sort of perform that inference. You can imagine uh, certain threats that we, ca that we can't test against, um, and so on and so forth, certain countermeasures that we can't test against. In these situations, we use models um, to do our evaluation or to supplement our evaluations. Um, and there's a whole host of reasons here. Really, they, they help us plan, they help us supplement. Um, so they're, by and large, useful. Um, and programs tend to like them because there's a theory that uh, they save on cost and, and planning. Um, however, uh, we can't just model anything and throw that into a report or use that kind of willy-nilly. Um, while there are many good reasons to use a model, it's not a substitute for a real test. And the models that we use have to be uh, validated. And so that's um, a main concern of mine as a statistician, is how do we take mo computer models, say, and basically say, okay, this is good enough for my uh, intended use or my purpose. So validation is kind of a key statistical practice for me. Um, I'll explain that just a little bit on this slide. Um, validation is, it's an assessment of the extent to which a model uh, disagrees with live test data. Um, that's kind of the John Heyman definition of validation. It'll, it'll be different. It's written differently elsewhere. And this sort of schematic on the slide, um, this gives you some idea of what I'm talking about. So the top row of the schematic is kind of my picture of like a live test. Um, and this is an example of a live fire test event where, you know, say we're interested in the uh, vulnerability of a certain engine component. We would actually fire some munitions at that uh, engine component and actually see what happens. That's a live test. Um, the modeling and simulation is, it's a computer simulation. That's the bottom row of the schematic. Um, we would do some sort of, um, we'd cre create a computer model, iterate on that computer model, but at the end of the day, we compare that computer model, say both the live test and the computer model, they output some penetration measures. We would compare those penetration measures and we'd make some sort of statistical assessment about how good the model is. And that's what we call validation. Um, so this is, uh, a, I think this is mainly a statistical practice, although there's a lot of things that kind of bear on validation. Um, but I wanna talk, I wanna switch gears a little bit. Now that I've kind of given you the background, uh, I wanna talk a little bit about what other disciplines might be able to tell us um, about validation. Because I think in the DOD, DOE, NASA world, you know, we're kind of in our own little silo and we can really learn a lot from data practices elsewhere. 
And I'll start with a sort of controversial paper. So um, I don't know if many of you, if you've heard of, of uh, there's a researcher named Doug Altman, who was a famous statistician at Oxford. Um, he passed away, I think, uh, unfortunately, this year or last year. But he wrote a very influential paper uh, in the British Medical Journal uh, about 25 years ago. Um, uh, the paper was called The Scandal of Poor Medical Research. And in that paper, he basically um, made some hand-wavy arguments for why a lot of published uh, papers in medical journals are, are wrong. And so what he said was, if you look across the medical literature, you will find inappropriate designs, you will find unrepresentative samples, small samples, incorrect analyses, and faulty interpretations. And um, he was uh, essentially uh, validated uh, 10 years later when John Unides at Stanford uh, did an actual uh, uh, sort of Bayesian power analysis to basically say that a lot of research in medicine really is underpowered. Uh, so Altman actually, he proposed the idea, he sort of laid the groundwork, and then Unides at Stanford did the actual data analysis to kind of show that there really was uh, some problems here. Okay, and um, we're talking about medicine. This isn't like, uh, this is serious stuff, right? We're talking about clinical trials. Uh, these have to be right. Um, but it turns out there's a lot of errors. It turns out the sentiment has not changed greatly in 25 years. Um, so this is a sort of a more recent quote um, from Frank Harrell. Um, the context here was medicine and biostatistics, but you could probably apply this to work at your job. Um, he said, we have more data than ever, more good data than ever, a lower proportion of data that are good, a lack of strategic thinking about what data are needed to answer questions of interest, suboptimal analyses of data, and an occasional tendency to do research that should not be done. Um, so that is really not comforting um, at all. Um, and I think a lot of t and &E professionals in the room, they kind of, th I think this quote probably resonates with you, it certainly resonates with me, I get data, th data thrown at me constantly, and I constantly have to think about, does, you know, is this actually helping me? Um, so what I would like to do is propose um, that Doug Altman and Frank Harrell might be onto something. Um, there might be some faulty practices um, in DOD data analysis and MNS validation. Um, we will never know for sure because a meta-analysis of DOD t and &E is essentially impossible due to classification reasons. Um, but what I want to outline here is basically this, um, what I want to do is basically take Altman's critiques of medicine, uh, this is my motivation uh, for uh, thinking about ways to improve what statisticians do. I want to take his five points about medical research and propose that they are to varying degrees affect DOD research and uh, MNS validation studies um, in particular. Um, so of his, Altman's five problems with medicine were inappropriate designs, unrepresentative samples, small samples, incorrect analyses, and faulty interpretations. Um, I believe that inappropriate designs, unrepresentative samples, and small samples are massive problems for validation studies and DOD, um, a lot of DOD testing and, and evaluation. Um, inappropriate designs, um, that's an unavoidable problem, usually because um, the d types of designs that we are able to do in DOD t and &E are not like clinical trial designs. We're not able to, um, in many cases, measure the improvements or, uh, that we'd like to that would allow you to say, basically say if equipment A is better than equipment B. Usually that's not possible. Unrepresentative samples, if you're a t and &E professional, you're probably aware of this one. Our test ranges are old, antiquated. We don't have the latest threats. Um, we're constantly playing an intelligence game to try to figure out exactly what to test against. So um, we, the most up-to-date uh, data that we could get is simply not there. Um, small samples are, is obviously a problem. If you shoot off a missile, you're not going to do it 100 times. You're going to do it a couple times. That's the facts of life. Um, so those are the, my top three reasons uh, for thinking hard about statistical practice. Um, the other two, I'm not sure. So there may be some motivation here, but maybe not. I think faulty interpretations of data, I think we're probably pretty good at doing that in um, DOD t and &E. um, Incorrect analyses, I really don't know. Um, the things I see, I, I think are good. Um, so, but I don't want to say, I don't want to say, well, everything Ida does is, is good. It's true, um, but <laughs> I'm a fan of the things I see. 
um, but there's things I don't see, so I don't know. Um, anyway, so that's my view of Altman's problems, at least how they apply to our work. And so I think there's a lot of reasons that we should take data and statistics really seriously when it comes to validation studies. Um, I believe statisticians uh, can improve uh, the quality of MS studies considerably, um, but it takes a lot of hard thinking. And um, it takes a lot of collaboration. And in this talk, I, I've kind of given you the motivation, I've given you the setup. Now I kind of want to give you like the so what. So the next part is the here's what we can do to actually uh, integrate and uh, improve with our teams and really make sure MS validation studies are uh, high quality. Um, and hopefully reduce the extent to which some of these, some of Altman's issues are problems for our domain. That's my goal. Um, okay. So the remainder of the talk, what I'm going to do is basically present my eight recommendations. Um, so this is, um, again, it's, it's sort of non-technical, uh, but basically I want to present basically eight ways that statisticians, I believe, can improve uh, validation studies. Um, and I th hope I have the right audience for this one. Um, so I'll give you the, uh, th this is kind of the short version, and uh, I'll kind of dive into each of these, and then you'll get to see kind of more of exactly what I'm thinking. But here are kind of my eight recommendations, and uh, they're roughly grouped into three areas. So I want to think about ways statisticians can improve design. I want to think about ways that statisticians can improve the process um, of validation and DOD testing writ large. And I want to think about how we can improve on our analyses. Okay, so those are my three groupings. And um, I'll just step through each of these uh, one at a time. Okay. Um, so my, my first of eight recommendations that statisticians, data scientists, and other data-minded individuals can kind of bring to the table is, uh, number one, first and foremost, it's exactly what Ida has been preaching uh, for years and years, is um, bring experimental designs to the table. Um, so DOE, or the design of experiments, I'm sure that there's some very technical statistical uh, uh, definition of DOE, but roughly what it is is it is a language to discuss the trade-offs that are associated with test planning. Um, it can, you can make it very, very complicated, but that's sort of the basics of what design is. If you do a good design, you get a lot of extremely good things. Um, good design optimizes the utility of a test. It clarifies how we are to analyze the data, and through that clarification, too good, I would call this meta-analysis probabilities occur. You maximize the probability that analysts agree on what to do with the data, <laughs> and you uh, minimize the probability that you run into an, anal an analysis problem. Uh, good DOE means we see a design, we agree on what we're going to do with the data from the design, um, and we minimize disagreements, we minimize problems. Um, design informs analysis, so that's really, really critical. Um, We've specifically done a lot of research on what kinds of designs are, are helpful for MS validation, and we've kind of settled into the uh, uh, space filling design recommendation for a lot of the validation problems that kind of come through our office. Um, I'm not going to go into exactly what those are, but it's our experience that those have been uh, very useful for some of our problems. Um, so I'll just, I'll just throw that out there. It's one specific targeted way that the test community can improve on validation. Recommendation number two is we can improve planning by, I call this, uh, clarifying the estimand. So oftentimes there is a lack of critical thinking about how we connect uh, requirements with data. And the estimand is basically um, a statistical notion for doing just that. It's often the primary objective of a validation study to demonstrate that sim data is, is congru congruent with live data. Um, that's kind of maybe some of the language that gets talked around, talked, uh, tossed around in a program, but what does it mean statistically to, for sim data to be congruent with live data? Uh, the estimand is, is kind of what that means. So it's that st forming that statistic. It's doing, making that plan of exactly what we're going to do with the data when we get the data. And in validation, this can be uh, very tricky. So um, I just have a little example here. I'll dive into it a little bit more on the next page. Um, but oftentimes, you know, if we're looking at, say, a missile system or something that hits a target, and the outcome, uh, primary effectiveness outcome is the probability that the missile, say, hits the target, 
there's different ways of measuring discrepancy. You could take the difference of two probabilities. You could take the ratio of two probabilities. Um, if the difference is, say, near zero, that's good. If the ratio is near one, that's good. But they don't mean the same thing, and they form different confidence intervals. And you have to work through those problems. And so figuring out what those are and what's the best way um, is really going to help you um, simplify and clarify for people that are not data experts. Um, you have to anticipate these problems. Um, so that's really a, that's a recommendation of mine. You don't want to be in a situation where you, where you just kind of throw up your hands and say, well, I will know what to do when I see the data. That's just bad planning. Um, okay, so, and here's my uh, quick example. This is just sort of, this is, this is a real example from our work in dot &E and IDA. Um, joint air-to-ground missile, um, this is, uh, there are basically a lot of goals um, in this validation concept. And here's my kind of example of like the estimand, um, which is basically taking these two goals and making them data centric. Um, so number one is um, the goal was basically ensure the aggregate missed distance distribution of the sim shots agrees with the live shots. In terms of data and statistics, we might say um, I want to estimate the the difference between the vertical dif difference between two CDFs and put a bound on that or do a hypothesis test on that. The other goal was to determine whether MNS accounts um, for factor effects. What are the factor effects that affect missed distance uh, between the sim and the live? The estimate would be we would look at the change in the mean missed distance uh, between the, uh, that's caused by the test factors. So taking goals, taking requirements, and making a plan for what you're going to do with the data, that's, that's the estimate, and that's really the, the benefit that statistics brings. Um, number three, this is my last design recommendation, is... Um, clarify experimental units. And again, this is a John Heyman definition of an experimental unit. It might not be what your textbook says, but when I say experimental unit, I basically mean the smallest independent unit of the data. Sometimes you get a spreadsheet of data from a program, and it's like a million lines long, um, but really it's a spreadsheet of sample size one, and those million rows are all correlated in some way that doesn't help you. Um, Explaining what the experimental unit is is going to clarify what to do with the data. You did this in STAT 101 uh, when your professor told you to flip a coin or roll a die. Roll a, die. Um, a coin flip or a dice roll is the experimental unit. Different coin flips are independent. Figuring out what's independent in your test informs how you look at the data. But in real life, everything is correlated. So you have to break it down to what's not. And a lot of times, at least in my work, things that are not correlated are things that occur at the mission level. And so that kind of tells me the mission is where I need to aggregate my data. Um, that's, where I can that's where I need to sort of focus on my analysis. Of course, if I can't do that, um, when the units are not independent, a good analysis needs to consider that correlation, and you have to work through what it takes to do the right analysis. But it gets a lot harder when things are not independent. Um, OK. So those are my three design recommendations. I'm going to go into my process recommendations, and then I'm going to go into my um, final uh, recommendations for how statisticians can help. Um, recommendation number four is collaborate. Do not consult. So w failures, um, statistical failures, are when the statistician just gets brought in to do like a quick analysis and then gets shooed out the door. Um, statisticians should be partners, essentially, throughout the entire life cycle um, of a program. Statisticians should have that program knowledge so that they know how to target their recommendations and so that they know how to um, suggest improvements, so that they know how to educate their partners and their collaborators. Um, but really importantly, here's another meta probability of mine. In collaboration, um, statisticians can focus on minimizing the probability of producing misleading results, which is what I think is really the value of having, having statisticians on a team. Uh, I think it, we often forget in T&E that analyses can be wrong. You can, say, you can make wrong recommendations to decision makers, and there's really a lot riding, there's a lot on the line. If a system is, is effective, suitable, survivable, we have to say that it is, and we have to sort of quantify that uncertainty um, but there's a lot of, there's wrong ways to do that. Um, and there's a, really a lot riding on these decisions. Um, when, collaborate, when statisticians are true collaborators, then they know how to integrate and they know how to make um, decisions, they know how to make analyses better. Um, so that's my fourth recommendation. Um, number five, and this is uh, a bit of a meta recommendation, is if you are a statistician 
data scientists, et cetera, um, don't just sort of box yourself in to one sort of job role. You need to branch out, and you need to apply your discipline, your critical thinking skills, your data skills, to all parts of validation studies, because the statistics is just one part of it. But the critical thinking skills that statisticians get in school um, are unlike any other discipline, and you have to apply those to non-statistical problems um, or other sorts of data problems. And when you do that, good things generally happen. Um, at least in, I've learned that there's, I think there's a lot of ways that statisticians can have a lot of impact in validation and, and T&E, but it's unclear how we do that at first. And so my recommendation for statisticians and data scientists is to just throw yourself into new things. Um, because you will help the bottom line guaranteed because you underestimate your own value and what your skills bring to the table. Um, number six is in validation studies, um, keep an eye on the ball. Proactively address statistical inadequacies. Um, if you see something that is wrong, if things are starting to go off the rails, you have to say something immediately. If you do not speak up when things go wrong, then you are a failure. So you, because once things start going, this is how programs are. Once things start going in one direction, it is hard to get them back on the rail. So you have to fix things as soon as possible. And it is very easy for things to get off the rails design and data wise um, because there are non-experts trying to do data. And they should, they, everyone should be you know, data um, literate. Um, everyone should be using data. Um, but statisticians should not be shy about um, when they see misdeeds against data. They should report them. Um, there's a lot of um, other things here that kind of go along with this, um, but we have a good we have we kind of have a duty to explain. Uh, statisticians have a duty to explain their assumptions, explain the concepts of validation, exp um, show mock analyses, show mock validations, so that things stay on track, um, and really explain. Um, how risks can influence the way things go with validation studies. Um, people, I think, uh, a big component of validation that tends to get sort of glossed over is um, how good is good enough influences validation studies, but that's a really hard thing to talk about. And, but that is exactly something statisticians can help um, programs uh, talk about, is by basically supplying the data and the language to talk about risks. That's another value statistics brings. Um, specific uh, recommendation here, another one, is keep track of what data are used for what parts of validation. Um, oftentimes, uh, maybe I'll say non-statisticians, they tend to use all data for all things, and sometimes that is inappropriate. Um, so keep track of what you're doing with your data. Okay, and now I'm moving to my final two recommendations. Those were kind of my, my process recommendations, and I've got some analysis recommendations that statisticians can bring. So uh, number one is on methods, and so this one's important to me because um, I co-lead a, a team of researchers at, at IDA, and one of my specific um, obligations is to, and interest is to work on, on methods for the test community. So I think what statisticians should do is think about what, what assumptions commu the community wants to make. So we do a lot of data analysis um, in the t and &E community, but we don't talk about what assumptions we're putting into that data. Uh, we kind of like to sweep those under the rug. And what I've learned talking to a lot of data analysts and physicists and um, program folks is that we don't like to make assumptions because uh, it sounds like if you're making an assumption, that's an opportunity to be wrong. And so I think we as a, as a statistical community, we should think I have one minute? Okay, great. So I'll finish up. Um, we as a community should think we should align our methods with the assumptions that folks are willing to make. And so that might mean more research in non-parametric methods. That might mean research in methods that relax linearity assumptions because uh, people <laughs> hate when you, when you fit a linear model and it looks wrong, um, boy, I that's something that you know, can't go in your report if the model is just wrong. Um, so we need to think about ways of sort of like doing more uh, non-parametric uh, ordinal data. We need to think about how to model correlated data. We need to think about how to model all the data problems that we encounter um, in a way that corresponds to our assumptions. Um, so that's recommendation number seven. Uh, fit the methods to the problem. Um, 
Lastly, we should recognize that our role as statisticians is just a singular role. Uh, t &E problems, model validation problems, these are big problems, they're team problems, and we're just members of that team. So it takes a team of folks to pull off a successful model validation. And the way I kind of uh, write this on the slide is validation is thoughtful stats plus consideration of risks. And it takes the subject matter experts, it takes the program experts, and the statisticians to come together to figure out what those risks are. Um, but many things bear on validation, and it's, it's not just statistical, although stats is a, a big part of it, in my view. Um, this is just a list of all, all of my recommendations. They're on the uh, Test Science DataWorks website um, for you to kind of go through. And my last slide, this is kind of a summary slide, but I kind of make this schematic, which kind of shows, like, this is my opinion about how my statistical recommendations help address certain statistical problems. Um, so they didn't just come out of nowhere. The design process and ana analysis recommendations are kind of targeted to, uh, to improve on the specific design and analysis problems that Altman first came up with 25 years ago. Um, so I'll just leave it on this slide and I'll ask if there are any questions. And if they aren't, what are some uh, strategies that you have for combating that? <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. This reminds me, I was on a DataWorks panel a year ago about how statisticians and teamwork, um, how statisticians can help with, with team exercises. Um, these are new recommendations, so I'm showing these off for the first time today. I try to apply these um, in my work, um, but I'm very fortunate to work in a very uh, data-centric, data-welcoming culture. And so generally the statisticians are kind of, are welcomed into teams, they're brought in and their opinions are, are kind of highly valued, um, at least I hope. So um, I, I find that these are, are easy to apply. I also find that um, like our jobs are frankly very hard. And if you uh, sort of make recommendations about how things might be able to go better, and if if you can kind of show like the improvement associated with your recommendations, which statisticians can often do through simulations and other means, then people are very thankful. If you can come into a project, you can collaborate, integrate, and say, hey, things are probably gonna go better if we do it this way, then that's, that's a win for everybody, not just the statistician. Thanks for that.